All right, it looks like it is the top of the hour and we have a number of attendees having joined now. So I think I will go ahead and kick us off so that we stay on time. So I'd just like to start by thanking everyone for joining us this morning, um, for joining us for this overview of the Global Power System Transformation Consortium which is what we will be um, taking and having an overview of today. Um, so I will just get us started by going through the agenda. Um, so today I'll just be um, introducing everyone and then I will hand it off to Fenton Sly who will be providing some remarks on the value of the Global Power System Transformation Consortium. We'll move on to an overview of the consortium as well as um, an overview of each of its five action pillars. Um, provided by um, our pillar leads here. Um, then we'll just wrap up with some more information on how you can engage with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, as well as a Q&A session. So a few housekeeping items just before we get started. Um, so there are two options for audio. You can either listen by computer or you can listen by phone. If you are encountering any audio issues, I suggest switching your mode of audio. So if you called in by phone, try your computer, vice versa. Um, you can also reach out to us on chat. Be sure to send it to um, all panelists and um, we can try and help troubleshoot. But um, mostly my, my suggestion, if you have any audio issues, is to try and swap your audio um, inputs, check your audio inputs, um, and you can always try rejoining. Sometimes that helps as well. Um, please use the Q&A function to submit any questions. Please notice that's actually distinct from chat, so please be sure you select the Q&A function. And um, you'll see that there is a drop down there where um, you can select who your message, your, your Q&A is being sent to. Please be sure to select all panelists to ensure that everyone can see your question um, so we can address it later on. Um, as I noted, um, please submit your questions at any time and we will address them during our Q&A session at the end. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the GPST web website in the, the coming days. Um, and we'll also be sure to follow up with everyone with a link to the recording as well, just in case you'd like to watch it again um, or share it with any of your colleagues. Oh, there we go. Okay, so our speakers today, um, as mentioned, my name is Isabel McCann. Um, I'm a employee of the National Renewable Energy Labs, um, and I am also the communications lead for the GPST Interim Secretariat. Today with us, we also have Fenton Sly, the National Grid ESO CEO, as well as the chair of our FSO CEO group. We have Sadie Cox, who um, is also from NREL, and she is the current director of the GPST Interim Secretariat. Charlie Smith from ESIG, who is our Pillar 1 lead. Sika Gonzaku from NREL, who is our Pillar Coordinator of the GPST Interim Secretariat. Balarko Shudri, who from the Imperial College London, who is the Pillar 3 co-lead. Um, Juan Carlos Montero Quiros. Um, from IEEE and the Costa Rica National Power Control Center, our Pillar 4 lead, and Mario Ragwitz from the Fraunhofer Institute, the Pillar 5 lead. And finally, we have Owen Zinemann from NREL who will be moderating our Q&A today, um, and he is our Research Agenda Group Technical Manager. So with all of the introductions complete, I will go ahead and hand it off to Fenton Sly who will provide some remarks on the value of the GPST consortium. Fenton? Isabel, thanks very much. Uh, and it's great to see so many people join. And it's great to see the GPST initiative uh, up and running and, and so much momentum behind it so quickly. So maybe uh, I'm conscious there's, there's a lot to get through in a, in a very short space of time. So I'm not going to, I suppose, waste too much time at the start with uh, my introductory remarks. Uh, maybe just to say who are the, the founding system operators and, you know, how, how do they end up as, as part of this uh, consortium? Well, firstly, they're a group of six system operators from around the world who are all dealing with the issues of a decar rapidly decarbonizing power system uh, with high levels of variable renewable generation and depending on the 
specifics of those individual system operators dealing with different aspects of that, but each of them in their own way at the leading edge of managing a rapidly decarbonizing uh, electricity system. The system operators are from the U.S. We have uh, CalISO and ERCOS. We have AMO from uh, Australia. And then in Europe, we have uh, EnergyNet, uh, AirGrid Group from Ireland, and uh, my own company, National Grid uh, ESO from uh, the U.K. And as I say, all of us in different contexts are dealing with fundamentally the same issues around how do we uh, enable, facilitate, accelerate the decarbonization of uh, the power system. So for us, the value of the GPSG consortium was probably around three things. One was uh, a forum to which we as six system operators could work closely together and share information, insights, uh, solutions to some of those, those issues. But I think more importantly, it was a mechanism by which we could work with some of the leading research organizations and institutes uh, around the world. And that has the advantage of helping shape the research agenda uh, to specifically point at some of those really core issues that need to be solved if we are to push uh, decarbonization of the electricity system further and faster. So that collaboration between this group of founding system operators and the research institutes enables that to happen. And indeed, a lot of the initial work has been around what is that research agenda? What are those priority topics that we really need to focus on? On the other side, it, it of course provides insight to those research organizations into those core practical problems and issues that, that the system operators are, are facing. It provides, helps provide access to uh, information, people, experts as well. So hopefully uh, a relationship that, that both sides benefit from going forward. But the third piece of it, I think, uh, is around, for all of us in terms of the system operators, is also around how do we share that information and insight that we have being at the, at the forefront of that decarbonization effort with some of those other jurisdictions or system operators or governments uh, who are not as far advanced or who haven't yet come up against some of those technical issues. So we can avoid people reinventing the wheel or people um, being reluctant to, to decarbonize and showing how you can address the issues, you can't, that there are solutions out there. And by doing that, hopefully, accelerate at a global level, the scale and pace of, of decarbonization and a move overall to a more sustainable energy system. So it's bringing all of those bits together that we think that, the, uh, that this global uh, power system transformation initiative is so potentially uh, powerful and has the opportunity to move at, at a global scale uh, the agenda and the scale and pace of decarbonization of, of power systems. So that's all I was going to uh, say by way of introduction. Uh, I'm now going to pass it over to Sadie, I think, who will give a more uh, fuller explanation of uh, the various elements of, of the consortium before we move on and talk about the individual pillars within that. So, Sadie, I think I'm handing it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Fenton, for those, for those remarks. And it's absolutely invaluable to have you and the other founding system operators engaged with the GPST. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, it's excellent to have such a large audience on the webinar today. Um, as, as Isabel mentioned, my name is Sadie Cox, and I'm the director for the GTST Interim Secretariat. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce you all today to the GTST Consortium overall. So, the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or the GTST, is a new initiative that we recently launched together with many partners around the world with a really targeted focus on support and collaboration with system operators to research and implement cutting edge technologies and solutions required to bring very high levels of renewable energy and complementary technologies onto the grid. So as I mentioned, um, we're working with a number of world class partners globally through the consortium and, and Fenton talked about this as well. Um, so to really set the research vision of the GPST, as, fin as Fenton mentioned, um, we're working with our group of founding system operators or FSOs at the CEO level 
And this includes AEMO in Australia, National Grid in the UK, EIR Grid um, in Ireland, EnergyNet in Denmark, California ISO, and ERCOT in Texas. And this is really a group of system operators that's leading the world in terms of current VRE penetration levels. So this group of CEOs is championing research activities of the consortium, and they have been defining a set of common research priorities across these system operators, which can then inform really critical investments at the national level. Um, in addition to FSOs, we also have a core team of world-leading technical institutes, which you can see on this slide, um, from all regions of the world that have come together with a real, to really kind of define the direction of the consortium and to lead on specific topical pillars and regional activities, which I'll cover in a moment. Um, and this core team includes the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, the Energy Systems Integration Group, or ESIG, CSIR in South Africa, CIRO in um, Australia, IEEE, the Osgeon Center for Energy in South Asia, Olade in Latin America, Fraunhofer in Germany, Imperial College in London, CTU in Denmark, and NREL in the United States. And in, in addition to the core team and the FSOs, we're also partnering with 10 developing country system operators to support them in advancing power system transformation, and many of them will also be serving as leaders for peer learning in particular regions. And we have official partners listed here, which include system operators in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, South Africa, and Peru. And again, we're actively forming partnerships with several others. So we came together with this group of partners with a common understanding that technical and engineering knowledge required to support global power system transformation was not being created or transferred at the speed and scale required to really meet the critical challenges in front of us. And so as a GPSC consortium, we're seeking to address this global need with our targeted research and support to system operators. So next slide. Okay, so why work with system operators? So most importantly, system operators really are where the rubber hits the road in terms of actually integrating larger shares of renewables with the grid and hold ultimate responsibility in implementing actions to enable low cost, low emission and reliable power system transformation globally. Decision makers and other stakeholders also trust and listen to system operators due to their deep technical knowledge. So system operators can be really critical in encouraging policymakers to raise their ambitions and confidence in, in achieving clean um, power system transi transition. Um, so with this in mind, it's necessary for system operators to implement key operational and engineering solutions in order to integrate high levels of um, BRE and other clean technologies and to prepare their grids to attract large scale investments. And to do that, there's a clear need for both further innovative research and technical assistance to transfer knowledge on proven solutions. Um, we also know that system operators are inspired by and learn best from each other, and this is why the consortium will be bringing together system operators to share knowledge in various ways, such as through fellowship opportunities and through learning forums and other activities. And then finally, cross-sector electrification is, of course, a growing area of interest and attention, and system operators have an important emerging role within that context. So next slide. Um, so the GPSC exists within a broader ecosystem of support for clean energy development and transformation, and each element of this ecosystem is really critically important. So many programs are focused on policy advocacy solutions as well as market policy and regulatory actions, and we as a GPSC are focused on another key element, which is on advancing technical solutions and approaches through cutting-edge research and targeted technical assistance and peer learning. And our work in this area really reinforces and complements all of the crucial work in the market policy and political economy spaces. And across all of these areas, there's a need for scaled up um, support. And we through the GPSC are seeking to address just one of these critical areas where we can add tremendous value through our world-class partners um, in collaboration, again, with a broader ecosystem of programs um, as presented on this slide to really bring together all pieces of this puzzle. Next slide. Okay. so. On this slide, I'm gonna walk through the theory of change for the GPSC. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, we have a core team of the consortium which brings together leading technical institutions from around the world in developing and developed countries to support um, work across a really comprehensive set of pillars, which I'll walk through in the next slide, and to really work at the technical level to advance power system transformation. And as I described before, we also have um, our group of founding system operators, which are really championing the research elements of the GPSP together with the core technical institutions um, and setting a broader vision for the consortium. And then the FSOs, together with the core team, are working with our developing country system operators to provide direct technical assistance and to support peer learning and exchange and ultimately to transfer knowledge on really advanced solutions to enable low carbon power system transitions. 
So together with all these partners, we'll be advancing cutting edge research innovations, transferring and improving knowledge, capacity, and tools, really focusing on localizing technology solutions with countries around the world. Um, so as I mentioned before, we absolutely do not exist in a silo, um, and we've been working very closely with this broader ecosystem of institutions that you see here along with others to ensure that we're providing really complementary support um, to the many uh, efforts that are focused more on the policy, regulatory, and investment side and filling those technical gaps that are really crucial to enable large-scale investments in renewable energy and other low-carbon technologies. Um, so together with this ecosystem of collaborators, we can significantly scale up grid modernization around the world. We can support countries in developing more ambitious plans and visions for power system transformation, and importantly, really raise the confidence of our partner to implement advanced low carbon grid solutions. And all of this collaborative work will result in significant impacts, including increases in private sector investment in advanced power systems. It will reduce cost of energy for consumers. Um, we, of course, also aim to really significantly reduce emissions. And through the GPSP, together with partners, we have a visionary goal of reducing power sector emissions by 50% in 10 years. Um, very importantly, we'll also focus on increasing reliability and resilience of the grid and supporting increased jobs and economic development powered by clean energy. So next slide. Okay, so now I wanted to move into um, the structure and the activities of the consortium more specifically. So this slide lays out the pillars of support of the consortium and essentially how we work with system operators. So we'll talk through each of these pillars in more detail in the upcoming slides, but just wanted to provide a quick overview here. So pillar one is coordinated by ESIG, um, and is where we're bringing together, again, our founding system operators, um, so to develop a high-level research agenda on the most forward-looking research areas um, to support very high levels of our integration, and then using that information and prioritize topics to inform um, investments at the national level. Pillar two is where the core team and FSOs are partnering with developing country system operators to provide deep technical support through fellowships and targeted holistic technical assistance on advanced operational engineering solutions, as well as broader peer learning at the regional and global level. Pillar three is coordinated by Imperial College in London and is focused on improving and applying cutting edge educational materials and courses at the university level and upskilling the current system operator workforce with continuing education. Um, and we're also discussing with USAID a possible area of this work targeted at female system operator training and empowerment um, to really enable female leadership on power system transformation around the world. Pillar four is coordinated by IEEE and is focused on supporting countries on technology standards, certification, and testing to enable higher levels of renewables um, and integration of complementary technologies with the grid and really localizing technologies to very unique contexts. And finally, Pillar 5 is focused on uh, collecting, improving, and disseminating best-in-class open data and tools to support system operators with various types of key analyses to enable grid integration. Um, in addition to the Pillar coordinators, all core team members participate and provide support across the various pillars. Um, and as a really critical element of our work, we have our regional lead in institutions that will be coordinating peer learning, country-level technical assistance, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, um, and those are the ASEAN Center for Energy in Southeast Asia, uh, CSIR in South Africa, and Alade in Latin America. And then finally, NREL is serving as the interim secretary of the consortium, and this means coordinating activities across these pillars from a high level, providing oversight and management, um, and overall quality control. So next slide. Um, so on this slide, we have presented kind of the key elements of governance for the consortium as well as the funding model. So the first column on this slide is focused on Pillar 1, and so under Pillar 1, our FSO CEOs are providing executive level leadership and oversight, and just under the CEOs, we have a research agenda group that's working more at the operational level to actually define the research priorities that are common across these system operators, and Charlie Smith will talk more about this work in a moment. Um, and then various research institutions and global teams will actually be implementing this research based on proposals that will be developed and aligned with the research agenda um, and funding would come from government research agencies and foundations. And then across the GPSP, so this is the other column, we're forming um, a steering committee that will include CEOs from system operators, major sponsors, um, key partners uh, to play the broader kind of strategic visioning and oversight role for GPSP. Um, and then underneath that, we have the Secretariat, which is again currently housed at NREL, which is managing, managing the program kind of overall and coordinating across the various activities and pillars. 
Um, and then the GPST Coursing Institute, together with other partners, are actually implementing the work across the pillars um, and funding from development agencies and foundations um, can either come in through the secretariat or through these different institutions to actually implement the activities of the consortium. Um, I also wanted to note some of our key funders for the consortium across all pillars, um, and those include the Wealth and Climate Initiative, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, U.S. government, and BMWI in Germany, among others. And so we're very grateful for their support. Um, in addition to those key funders, all of our core team institutions, um, especially the pillar and regional leads, are also providing significant in-kind support for the GPS as well. Um, so I think that's it for me for now. Also, next, we'll move into deeper dive descriptions of the GPSC pillars, beginning with Charlie Smith, who is the executive of Transcendent and leading coordinator of our work on the one. So, thanks. Look forward to questions at the end. I'll be back again in a moment. Okay, thank you, Sadie. So, why don't we go ahead and move on to pillar one? As Sadie mentioned, I'm the executive director of ESIG, which serves as the coordinator for Pillar 1. Uh, Mark O'Malley is my sort of co-pillar lead, and we work across all of the pillars, but with special responsibility for Pillar 1. The major activity of the, of the last really six months or more has been the Research Agenda Group, which Sadie mentioned. The Research Agenda Group consists of the senior technical people from the six FSOs, as well as the leading research institutes. And we've been working with the system operators on identifying and prioritizing the major or top priority research issues for the founding system operators as we look to systems with very high penetrations of renewables in the future. And we've organized those into a set of research programs, and the programs have been organized into the research agenda and action plan, which was reported out in December, outlining the six different research programs addressing 20 of the highest priority near-term research questions. And a plan has been developed and it's been approved by the CEOs in a call in December. This is the core set of activities that the Research Agenda Group will be working on in the near term for the next six months, but in the longer term, the research program, I think as was mentioned, ex extends actually over a 10-year period. So work is beginning. In the, uh, the top research questions dealing with grid forming inverters, that will be started, has been started actually in uh, December and now in January. There's a research agenda group call later today to uh, provide some tighter coordination and initial um, planning for getting the, the work off the ground. The work will build on some of related work that's going on in ESIG and our reliability working group and together with the time available from the leading system operators and the core team. Uh, we hope for some significant progress in the first six months of, of the new year, 2021. Okay, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, research support and peer learning that's going on in Pillar 1. The uh, research activities are expected to be funded not only through the foundations that Kate Sadie mentioned just a minute ago, but also through the normal research funding channels that are available through each of the national research programs. But every country has its own uh, research funding process, and we hope to tap into those funding processes for raising between 20 and $100 million a year for funding of the research agenda. A good example is a recent procurement that just come out from DOE through the normal course of events, the kind of thing that we'll be looking for and looking to tap into. It's a $25 million procurement dealing with grid-forming inverter issues, which uh, NREL will lead a response for. It'll actually be an international response, but we'll be looking for these kinds of opportunities um, coming from traditional research funding sources from the national uh, energy programs throughout the world and looking to tie into these programs with our uh, GPST research agenda. So we, we hope to build up a program of 20 to $100 million a year of research activity to address these uh, research questions that need to be need to be addressed and solved for enabling uh, confidence on the part of the system operators and operating systems with very high 
a share of inverter-based resources. On the peer learning front, uh, we've scheduled a series of webinars throughout the year. There'll actually be one a month. The first one has been scheduled for for January. It's been uh, posted on the eSig website. It's being posted on the GPST website. All are invited to attend. It will actually be presented by a member of one of the core team institutes, the Deepak Ramasubramanan from EPRI, and he'll be speaking on the topic of frequency control in 100% inverter-based resource power systems. It's a very popular topic. We've already got 600 people registered for the event, and now we can accommodate a few hundred more. So I encourage you, if you're interested in this, to please feel free to sign up. That will be held on January 20th. And there'll be a one webinar like this dealing with uh, GPST Pillar 1 activities for each month during the year, in addition to some additional webinars that I think Sadie will talk about at the end. As far as engagement with Pillar 1 is concerned, if you go onto the GPST website, you'll see a form there which uh, encourages you to indicate which of the pillars you're interested in. And if you are interested in Pillar 1, we actually had a kickoff meeting in December describing the overview of Pillar 1 and ways of becoming involved in the Pillar 1 activities, ways of getting engaged. And for those who have been indicated an interest, we have followed up with a questionnaire trying to identify who you are, what your interests are, what your capabilities are, and figuring out uh, how we will factor you into the activities of Pillar 1 and what activities you would like to be a part of. So in a thumbnail, that's a brief update on Pillar 1 activities. I guess I'll turn it over to uh, Pillar 2. Yep, this will be um, Sika Gonzanku from uh, INREL will be walking us through Pillar through pillar 2. Sika? Hey, um, <clears throat> thank you, Isabel. So as Sadie mentioned, Pillar 2 is focusing on system, op system operator technical support. So as part of this work last year, we took an in-depth, we undertook an in-depth landscape analysis to identify where the consortium could add most value to ongoing work around the world. So based on several discussions with different system operators and different institutions, we identified a list of initial country and regional partners. So that's on the left um, side of the slide. And the countries that have been starred are the countries where we have confirmed partnerships. And as an example of the work that we will be doing um, in the consortium as we've already started doing is that the GPSG is providing expert assistance to Indonesia's system operator PLN and providing recommendations as they develop a new control center for one of their regional grids. And this work will directly kind of inform you know, the reliable operation of their grid as they plan to bring on higher shares of renewables. Next slide, please. So this slide just summarizes what we see as a robust technical assistance approach. So starting from the left to the right, on the left we have kind of a, that we will have a dynamic ongoing technical assistance program to meet the unique and evolving needs of the different regional and country partners we work with. And in addition to this, we will provide direct capacity building to different countries we're working with. And then we will also offer a fellowship program. So working with the excellent founding system operators um, leading you know, Pillar 1 efforts, we will host one to two technical staff at these founding system operators for one to three months, and this will provide kind of on-the-job training and, and skills developing to help them you know, see how they could integrate larger shares of renewables onto the grid. And this longer-term fellowship will really kind of address issues with providing shorter durations of technical assistance. And following this one to three month fellowship, we will have a fellowship synthesis where we will host the, fellow, uh, the fellows for two to three weeks at one of the core team institutions listed there on the slide. And this follow up period will really help the fellows outline a plan for how they plan to apply all of the different knowledge and skills they develop during the fellowship. And as part of this, we will also kind of provide full on remote and eventually in person technical support to all of the different fellows and just the you know, developing country system operators you are working with. And this whole kind of approach is what we see as integral to eventually bringing on more renewables onto the grid. 
And beyond this technical assistance approach, all of these different efforts will feed into kind of a broader regional system operator network so that a larger set of countries can benefit from all of the knowledge, research insights, and tools and capacity building that will come out of this consortium. So now I'll hand it over to Pillar 3. Thanks, uh, Sika. Um, as uh, Sadie mentioned uh, in our introduction, Pillar 3 is uh, meant to support the development of an inclusive and diverse workforce that's ready to handle decarbonization of the power system. Uh, this would include both upskilling of the existing workforce as well as uh, revisiting the postgraduate power education programs. Uh, to promote and facilitate adoption of uh, forward-looking topics that are essential for power system transformation. Um, we did a preliminary survey which showed that the curriculum structure and the training programs uh, vary a lot around the world. Hence, uh, our plan is to develop the teaching and training material as a collection of bite-sized topics which could be incorporated selectively into an existing curriculum based on the gaps and local uh, priorities. Uh, just to give you an idea, each topic would typically have three to four hours of lecture material, which is supported by two to three hours of uh, exercise. Uh, we have a group of academics from six universities across Europe and North America who met uh, regularly and identified a bunch of uh, forward-looking topics which aren't uh, typically covered at the required depth in a postgraduate power program today. And after wider consultation with the uh, founding system operators and other stakeholders, the teaching or training material on these topics will be developed and rolled out to our university partners in target countries for them to disseminate locally. And you can see some of the potential university partners listed on the final bullet on this slide. Again, as Sadie mentioned, one of the key focus areas in workforce development in Pillar 3 would be diversity, especially gender diversity, and to encourage upskilling of women and attract uh, more female students in postgraduate power programs, we plan to put together uh, motivational pieces, which highlights the career path and success stories of women professionals in leading roles within the fifth founding system operators. Also, we intend to have a diverse group of presenters delivering the teaching or training material, which uh, reflect the ethnic diversity of our intended global audience. So, that is a summary of where we are and what we plan to do in Pillar 3. Uh, look forward to hear your views and suggestions and take any questions uh, at the end of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Belarco. Um, next, we'll have Juan Carlos talk through Pillar 4. Juan Carlos? Hi, hello. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you today. My name is Juan Carlos Montero. And I'm IEEE volunteer, and I also work on the system operator at Costa Rica. So I fully understand and agree with the vision of the consortium as we deal with that type of power system transformation here a lot. Uh, IEEE is now leading the pillar number four. So as you can see, we're looking to investigate uh, technical areas focused on target of some regions and countries. We are looking to provide support on the standard testing and certification. Of course, conduct assessment on this type of uh, document standards. We are looking to create global resources and training on these areas. And of course, we are looking to have active uh, people. We are not just looking to receive information. We are looking to them to participate on standard uh, production development. That is important uh, for all of us. So for this year, we are already uh, developing great material important about key topics. We run a survey on power system operators. So we identified key topics, key needs from them, and especially key standards. So we are preparing a, a series of webinars about it. 
Uh, we are planning to have some uh, panel sessions in some uh, world venues because I think that's part of the, the beauty of IEEE and that's part of the things that we can do to support the consortium is that IEEE volunteers uh, are very diverse and we have global presence. So we are really happy to support this great initiative. As I said, I truly believe it in a personal level uh, during my daily job. And we are looking to create a lot of technical information that can improve the power system transformation and be able to work more in the carbonization. So thank you very much, and you're welcome to join us in this initiative. And next, let's hear about the next pillar with Mario. Thanks, Thanks Juan Carlos. a lot. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Juan Carlos. Um, <clears throat> welcome to Pillar 5 uh, on open tools and data. What is Pillar 5 all about? We want to, uh, in, in Pillar 5, uh, provide the toolboxes and um, the methodologies to assist system operators to plan and to analyze and to run uh, power systems in identifying application opportunities and gaps in open models and data with the focus on system operators as the key users of uh, such models for planning their assets and for running the assets and this in a very dynamic world of uh, changing towards uh, re renewable energies as the dominating source in power systems. And we want, in that respect, also further develop the existing open models and tools, in particular in order to increase the usability and the ease for deployment uh, at system operator levels. For example, user interfaces need to be developed in order to be more, uh, yeah, to have these, these tools better usable for uh, the system operators. We want to use this information to support system operators and other key stakeholders, for example, uh, for example, regulators, in order to rapidly scale up the power system transformation and integrate increasing shares of variable renewables. And uh, we see more and more that optimization tools for power system operators, not only in uh, developing countries, but uh, all around the world, are the key stumbling block in, in, uh, very, uh, in, in many cases. And therefore, expanding an open free access uh, and high quality data and tool uh, set will be of critical importance and uh, in many uh, decisive areas uh, to enable uh, power system transformation. And we are actually identifying those tools and data sets and have already provided also data sets in that respect. And thereby we investigate best practice, uh, regulatory best practice also, um, that is relevant to system operators to also recommend, recommend uh, suitable frameworks and uh, actions to be taken by country port partners in order to integrate rising shares of variable renewable energy sources, um, and we are at the moment uh, providing uh, case studies in several world regions in order to uh, <clears throat> uh, establish a framework under different framework conditions for uh, running power systems with high shares of renewables and for having the regulatory best practices in order to do so. Next slide. Um, what is the, the progress of our current work? We are currently active in developing key uh, data sets. Uh, some are already provided, uh, others are work in progress, and uh, we're uh, making them available. One uh, key example is the data, Renewable Data Explorer, uh, developed by MREL with uh, high renewable energy resolution time series and potential data. And uh, at the moment, we have uh, started, or we will start in the next month, actually, a project uh, uh, on a global hydrogen atlas where uh, techno-economic potential and analysis of hydrogen chains will be available and uh, to some or to large extent also uh, open access. And <clears throat> so the inputs are 
collected from uh, the different uh, developing country system operators on where we have the highest impact with uh, open data and tools and so how to focus our work because as you may imagine uh, the open data uh, world is uh, quite a broad spectrum of uh, a broad field and therefore we have to focus in uh, resources in, in that respect. Um, thereby a group of best in class tools uh, has been considered and we have developed a classification approach in order to determine and also differentiate the um, yeah, <coughs> best fields of uh, application for the different open models and open data tools that are available. And uh, for example, with input provided by system operators, but also the open mod uh, modeling uh, platform. And, and we identify and determine that tools that are most suited to the different needs of system operators. And uh, as one example, uh, we as uh, Fraunhofer are currently further developing the Pipes A tool, which is already a very widely used tool uh, globally in order to assess power system transformation. And uh, we are at the moment developing that tool further in order to uh, include also power to gas options and uh, the transition of gas pipelines and infrastructures to hydrogen into the system in order to uh, run a sector, sector coupled uh, energy system uh, for different world regions. And uh, currently we are also working on different uh, proposals in order to extend ex expand the uh, modeling framework and, and uh, these additional resources like for example from the German Federal Ministry of Economics are extremely important in order to actually uh, substantiate the effort that we can uh, put at uh, the uh, at, at these tasks in Pillar 5. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. Um, Sadie will pick back up here. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Mario. And thank you so much to all of the, the Pillar leads for those excellent overviews. And we're really grateful for all of your contributions to, to the consortium. Um, so I wanted to move now to talk a little bit about how um, everyone on the webinar today can engage with the GPSP going forward as we ramp up our activities, because um, we would love to have you all involved in, in various ways. So um, specifically, this is the first of an ongoing um, series of webinars, and our upcoming webinars will really dive into um, each of the pillars in much more detail through presentations and peer learning and interactive discussion on specific technical topics. Um, so it'd be great to have you all involved with those webinars. Um, as Charlie mentioned, on January 20th, we'll have our first Pillar 1 deep dive webinar on the topic of frequency control and a 100% inverter-based grid. Um, and so I think somebody mentioned in the chat that um, they weren't able to find the invitation for that yet, but we will be sending that out um, after the webinar today so that all of you have that um, invitation to the webinar, and it will be on the GPSD website as well. Um, in February, we'll have a deep dive webinar on Pillar 2 that will focus on sharing good practices and learning from advanced control room design um, as countries prepare for uh, higher levels of renewable energy integration. And we'll stand here from PLN and Indonesia on their really exciting work that Sika mentioned earlier, um, and EIR Grid in Ireland on leadership and activities in this space. Um, we'll also be launching a bi-monthly newsletter, so you can stay up to date on all of our webinars and other events, as well as publications, activities with countries, and related impacts, and other um, exciting areas that we'll be focused on. Um, so we've noted on the slide where you can sign up to get webinar invitations, the newsletter, um, and this will also be sent around just after the webinar, as I mentioned. Um, as a more specific opportunity within our website and from the link um, that's listed on this slide, you can also show interest in particular pillars uh, and, for example, actually engage in different ways with the Pillar 1 research, as Charlie mentioned earlier, um, help to develop and review curriculum through Pillar 3, um, and learn about other opportunities for more specific engagement. 
We'll also be launching regional peer learning networks, which Zika mentioned earlier, um, which would be, we'd be very glad to have um, folks on the call today engage with, and you can expect to hear more about that in our first newsletter, which will be coming out um, in the February, March timeframe. And then finally, we'd also like to encourage uh, developing country system operators to reach out to explore opportunities for either remote light touch assistance from the GTSP as well as opportunities for larger scale um, assistance through our Pillar 2 work. Um, and of course, please feel, to, please feel free to reach out to me or the GPSP email address that you see here if you have any other questions or feedback that we might not get to during the Q&A today. Um, so, yeah, so thank you all so much um, for, uh, for being here today. We're really looking forward to your questions and discussion, um, as well as continued interaction and collaboration as we move forward. Um, so I'll hand it now to Owen Zinneman. Um, who is going to moderate the discussion portion of the webinar. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so thanks, thanks all, to all the presenters for the uh, excellent comments. Um, definitely some, some great questions as well coming through in the Q&A and over, over chat, so we can just get going right away. Um, so the first question is for Mario. Um, Mario, how will you pick winners and losers with respect to tools uh, in Pillar 5? Is, it, is everything open source? Um, what about technical requirements, solvers, servers, uh, et cetera? And that question came from Barbara O'Neill. Yeah, I mean, probably I would first say it's less about winners and losers, but about suitability for different needs and uh, task and uh, challenges of uh, system operators. Like, for example, there are tools that are more suitable for a uh, long-term uh, system planning and other tools which are uh, more suited to uh, shorter-term system planning in combination with operation, or there are tools which uh, ha have a stronger focus on inter integrating different types of uh, structures like electricity, heat, uh, and uh, and gas infrastructures, uh, for example, and uh, so uh, they, that that is that's one element. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, winners and losers are uh, anyhow uh, depicted, and uh, definitely we only look for for tools which are uh, have the which have the full uh, characterization and quality of being open uh, and freely available in any respect uh, to uh, to the users and um we uh, also like one one aspect is also the ease of uh, using the different tools uh, in terms of uh, yeah um as you already uh, mentioned in your question uh, in terms of uh, computational uh, time and, and needs for uh, computational capacity and uh, here uh, like one tool, for example, that uh, appeared very uh, suitable to us for many questions in terms of long-term planning or medium-term planning and also integrating different types of infrastructures was, for example, uh, the Pipesay tool. But uh, there are a number of other tools uh, like Calliope, et cetera, uh, which are uh, very suitable open source tools uh, for uh, system planning. Uh, but uh, the, like the, in terms of uh, temporal spatial resolution and also uh, technical detail uh, models, the different tools uh, can dif differentiate, differentiate, differentiate a lot. And therefore, for us, uh, it's very important to show the landscape and also to show which tools are more suitable to analyzing really detailed uh, technical aspects of power systems and which are more suited to uh, model the, the long-term evolution uh, of a power, a power system for integrating renewables. Thanks, Mario. Great. Thank you, Sadie. I would just add to we are um, developing some criteria around identifying mm -hmm. our class tools. And I think as Mario mentioned, this is also, you know, it's also yeah. important to understand the context of each of the countries we'll be working with. Um, as we're thinking about tools to consider. But if anyone on the call today is interested in becoming engaged with that process of identifying tools, we'd be really happy 
um, to have you involved and to help review that criteria and let's really think through how we move forward here. So just wanted to add that. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Sadie. Uh, maybe <clears throat> as as you mentioned, the different criteria. I didn't want to go into all that detail here uh, because I didn't know how how uh, disaggregated that should be. But uh, those criteria are, for example, the level of open open access, the access method, the license that would be needed, uh, the coding language, the modeling approach, assessment criteria, and uh, also the model time horizon, the spatial coverage, temporal resolution, spatial resolution, and uh, the way electricity grid is uh, modeled, the sector coverage, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a multiple set of criteria. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Mario. Yeah, it's certainly it's it's something that we've uh, we your team in particular has just put a lot of thinking in, into uh, to sort of systematize that. So uh, appreciate you sharing that. Um, so the next question is going to be for Sika, and that's from um, Najib Dandachi. Um, so does the forum facilitate exchange as part of experience sharing and upskilling? Yeah. Yes, it does. So as presented you know, during the Pillar 2 overview, we will offer a fellowship program that specifically addresses that of you know, training technical staff from the different partner countries we're working with and on how to integrate large shares of renewables onto their respective grids. So it will be kind of a peer learning, knowledge exchange, and then how do you actually apply this to your day-to-day -day activities when you, once you return to your you know, respective institution. Great, thanks for that, Sika. Um, so a, a question for Belarco uh, from Russ Philbrick. So um, as mentioned in Belarco's presentation, um, what topics or courses were identified as needed for power system transformation but missing from traditional power system, uh, power system programs and curriculum? Hi, Russ, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I think missing is probably not the appropriate term because several of these topics are alluded to these days in uh, the postgraduate power programs, but maybe not covered in the required level of depth. Uh, and that is where we believe we can sort of uh, develop some of these courses. Uh, well, this list is quite long. I mean, there are about 90 odd topics that were identified by the group. But just to give you some examples uh, within the stability domain, topics like converter-driven and resonance instability, the role of grid-forming converters, modeling adequacy for uh, IBR-dominated power systems, IBR being inverter-based resources. Uh, these are the kind of topics that are in that list, and we hope to sort of share that uh, with the broader audience very soon once it's approved by all the stakeholders. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for that, Belarco. Um, so next, uh, so I, I just want to direct a quick comment towards Charlie, but then also ask you, Charlie, a, a, a broader question. So there, there was a comment uh, from a colleague at the National HVDC Center in the UK, Ben Marshall, um, and the comment was that, you know, on the subject of grid forming uh, converters, um, ben shared that his center has been involved in the, you know, Great Britain grid code, and, and so we work on this subject uh, for a while, um, among other topics, and he also shared that they have simulation and hardware in the loop capabilities at their center, that they work with National Grid ESO and the Great, the Great Britain trans, uh, transmission owners, um, and they have uh, areas of research that can be funded within their core budget in this area. Um, and that this might be worth exploring. So um, certainly um, he, Ben definitely just mentioned that he wanted to make sure he knew the best possible way to get in touch with you to discuss this uh, as a potential uh, resource that, that exists and is available for the consortium. Um, so a quick answer on that, Charlie, um, and maybe a reaction. And then a broader question, um, really, I, I, it would be great to just hear what are some of the substantive areas that are coming out as research priorities among the founding system operators. And if you can tell us a little bit more about those broadly. First of all, for the offer from Ben, it sounds like a great offer. Uh, I think that we would like very much to take him up on that. And I think that uh, you know, Mark O'Malley and I will discuss that after this, this webinar and get back to Ben. I presume we've got his, uh, his email information. If not, if you could send it to you. Oh, and that would be great. And Ben, thank you very much. It sounds like a very, a 
very wonderful, generous offer. On the, uh, the research priorities, the research agenda, there's half a dozen different areas that have been highlighted, uh, topical areas through the uh, prioritization of the research questions. They've been grouped into these six areas. Grid forming inverters is right at the top of the list. That's the one that's the most pressing. Some of the FSOs are looking at periods of time where they could be seeing upwards of 100% inverter-based resources instantaneously on their systems in the next five years or so. So that's a something coming on very quickly if these uh, issues are not addressed and, and uh, solutions, robust operating solutions, which will ensure reliability developed, then that could limit the uh, penetration of inverter-based resources until such solutions are developed. So that's really the most pressing question. Control room design is a another area that uh, focused a lot of the questions, a lot of the interest of the system operators, the ability to manage in real time the tools necessary, the uh, control room design and implementation that the operators will see and work with is a very critical area. Also, the, the software that's behind those tools, the real time observations, real time control that feeds into the uh, control room is a third area. System planning techniques such as the changing research resource adequacy paradigm uh, is a whole whole set of um, of research questions, probabilistic planning methods, black start capability, looking at black start in a system that's very uh, highly inverter based resource driven with many fewer synchronous machines on is an area for um, some future attention as well. So those are those are the big ones and some of the big questions, Owen. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Charlie. So uh, we're, we're just getting uh, close to finishing up here. May have time for one or two more questions. Um, there, there, a question came through from, from Raphael uh, Mello that said, uh, you know, first I'd like to congratulate you for this important initiative. Um, but the question is, um, so after subscription on the Get Involved page, what are the next steps for hands-on engagement in one of the pillars? And I think I'll direct that question first to Sadie, um, and then we can kind of take it from, from there. Yeah, thanks so much for that question, Raphael. So um, we are in the process right now of forming groups for each of the pillars, and so those kind of two ways that folks can engage. The first is sort of more on the substantive side, so really feeding into the technical work that's occurring under the pillar. And the other is just more kind of um, to engage on being updated on what's happening. Um, so if we're receiving like regular information on what's happening through the pillar. Um, and I should, should say under kind of that first option, there's also peer learning as well that will occur through each of the pillars. So either receiving peer learning or being engaged with writing presentations and that type of thing. Um, for each of the pillars, I would say pillar one is the furthest along in terms of kind of forming um, groups of folks that are interested in the pillar and they're actually forming a research advisory council that can feed into some of the research agenda work that's happening. Um, for the other pillars, so specifically for pillars um, four and five, we're right now in the process of kind of thinking through what those groups will look like. And I mentioned earlier that for pillar five, people could be feeding into kind of the criteria that we're developing around best in class tools. So that will likely be one way to engage. Um, for uh, pillar three, they also have a teaching agenda group that they've formed. And so when you sign up on the website, we'll be um, ensuring that you can engage with that group going forward. Um, and then on, on pillar two, it will likely be more related to kind of peer learning going forward with developing countries. So I know that's a lot of different ways to be involved, um, but we will be um, receiving information from the pillar leads in the near future when you sign up on the website on the different ways that you can um, be engaged either at the right substantive level or more kind of an information sharing level. So. I'll just leave it there in case others unless others want to add. Okay. Well, as it turns out, we are just up on the hour. So um, there, there are certainly um, quite a few other uh, questions in the chat. Uh, we will make sure to uh, reach out to you and get those questions answered. Um, I, I apologize that we weren't able to cover everything right now. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, I just want to thank all of our panelists for presenting, um, you know, on, on this really important initiative and, and also really to all of you participants for, for joining, for your, for your interest, for your engagement. Um, so 
yeah, with with that, I think we are going to close the session, and we we do look forward to being in touch and looking uh, for we look forward to finding ways to sort of collaborate together and to carry this consortium forward as a broader community. So um, thank you, and obviously please go to our website and uh, and and find our get involved tab and and sign up for our mailing list and express your interest in various pillars. Um, and yeah, we we thank you. So um, yeah, everyone have a a nice uh, morning or evening or wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.